I'm going to present on some specific optimization challenges that we faced with our WordPress theme install. And then um, my plan is to sort of whip through a bunch of slides and sort of talk about the LAMP stack in an oddball order. And then I wanted to leave a bunch of time for questions. So are you going to fast WordPress me off. Are you going to so, post this? Yes. Perfect. I'll put this. It's just not kind of, kind of problems in the way. But I'll get it on SlideShare. So um, I've been a dev sysadmin for 12 years. I've been doing Linux uh, deployments, production deployments for nine years. A bunch of different languages, mostly with scrappy, smallish nonprofits. And I work now at the Berkman Center for Internet and Society, and I maintain blogs.log.harvard.edu. So Harvard's one of those scrappy nonprofits. No, not anymore. That's why I said mostly. No, this year they are. Yeah, yeah, it's a, it's a tough world. Um, and then I manage, so to me, WordPress is just another app that I have to keep happy um, on a Linux environment. And I manage many different blogs, MediaWiki, or apps. So MediaWiki, some Rails apps, some legacy PHP apps, some Java apps, and whatever. So a lot of different things. And I, so I approach this more as a holistic sysadmin, you know, whatever. So my idea behind caching is, you know, your goals or performances, your goals are to use minimum resources to fulfill requests. You want to be able to, you know, batten down the hatches and survive slash dot and dig. You want it to be as unobtrusive as possible so people don't notice that this is happening. Like you don't have, you don't want to have stale caching or stale pages or anything. You want it to be easy to tune. There's <coughs> lots of knobs that you can fiddle if you want to, you know, set different policies. And the way I look at this is you want to think of it in terms of audiences that you're optimizing for. The way that I think about WordPress is you have two major audiences. You have people that are logged in and people that aren't logged in. And so we have a solution that works very well for us specifically for people that aren't logged in because of our specific uh, traffic. And then this is a rule that I generally apply. If you have to hit PHP, you failed. Except in some cases, you have to do PHP. Like if someone's logged in, obviously they're an admin. They need to be able to run PHP. So I kind of think about an app as, you know, the expensive stuff you want to reserve for the really important people, but otherwise you want to optimize to give everybody else statically cached um, information. So this is the order I'm going to talk about it because there's a bunch of things I just want to whip through because you can find stuff about tuning MySQL and whatever all over the internet. But so to start with MySQL. Um, you want to <coughs> optimize the tables. There's a number of uh, plugins that can do this for you. My favorite is to just set up a cron job and just run it every week or so. Some people get you know, like OCD about optimizing their tables and want to do it all the time. It's not worth it. Do it once in a while. And the best way to do it is a cron job and just forget that it exists. Um, you want to bump up your query cache, but don't expect it to be a panacea because the query cache has a lot of caveats applied to it and um, I just wouldn't expect magical things from it. Um, tuning key buffers can have a significant effect. Uh, this may all be stuff that you, I don't know if this is appropriate for people's experiences or whatever, but a lot of this, you can be insulated from worrying about the query cache and key buffers by using MySQL Tuner or Tuning Primer. SH. <coughs> Actually, I have a delicious, you can go to my delicious account and I have links to all these things in my delicious, so that'll come at the end. Um, you might want more indices on tables, depending. Um, one way that you can uh, check this stuff is you can look at the MySQL slow query log. That's all documented on MySQL site. Um, and you can use the debug queries plugin, which will give you a list of all the queries that have been running in your uh, WordPress. Um, and then you can run explain on them and figure out Basically, the rule of thumb I use for indexes is anything that appears in a where clause, you want to have an index on. And if you just do that, you're going to be 99% better. <laughs> WordPress defaultly, this is more for like custom development um, and if you're integrating custom tables. So I wouldn't worry about this generally for WordPress. Uh, if you find that MySQL is causing you problems, my top is like, are people familiar with top or viewing processes on Linux machines? All right, so my top is like top, but for MySQL. It will show you what's running what interactively. Um, and then I mentioned the slow query top log. There's also some weird 
Yeah, I was doing some Googling about what people say about MySQL and WordPress, and there was some weird advice I found out there that I don't think will have an effect, like cleaning out the options table. I don't know that that'll actually have an effect. There are plugins to do that for you, but it's kind of dangerous. It's like messing with your Windows registry if you want to do that. So up to you. I wouldn't spend a lot of time on it. Um, and then cleaning out old, old revisions and uh, old spam. I guess that's nice, but indexes are going to handle making those queries efficient for you. So I wouldn't think that you're going to do this and magically things will speed up. So that's why I said meh. Uh, OK, now we're going to talk about Linux really quick. So RAM, you can never really have enough RAM. Because the neat thing about Linux is it will use extra RAM for file cache. And that can be very, very efficient. Um, so like, if you look at a Linux machine and you just sort of naively look at the free RAM, you think, oh my god, all the RAMs you can use. But most of it's going, on a well-tuned machine, most of it's going to buffers. Request comes in, it'll come right out of the memory buffer and never even touch the disk. So that's very efficient um, use of your RAM. And I'll show you a graph, actually, sort of explain that a little bit. Um, you want to never use swap, because if you hit swap, you failed. Once you hit swap, you're thrashing the disk, and your machine is pegged, and your load's going to spike. So you want to try to optimize to not hit swap as much as possible. Fast disk, um, or the database on its own spindles, if possible. So you would partition, say, uh, your, you'd set up a partition dedicated to your database. And if you were deploying a new Linux machine, you can very easily in etsy.my.cnf tell it to use a different root directory and just move the MySQL around. It's really not that difficult. Um, fast network, duh. And then stat, if you're using a network file system like NFS, stat essentially when a PHP app runs, it will stat each file and uh, figure out if it's changed. And if it's changed, it will reload that file. Those can kill you in terms of performance because of the latency that a network file system introduces. So you can cache those stats, or we can look at something else. I'll, I'll get to that. Are there any questions so far? OK, so I'm going to look through this. OK, so Apache. Apache, how many people don't deploy WordPress on Apache? <coughs> right, cool. Excellent. So with Apache, um, Nginx, fast CGI. Okay. Yeah. Um, one of the key things with Apache, anybody, is, are people familiar with a reverse proxy? Anybody deploying a reverse proxy? Okay, so the neat thing about a reverse proxy, this is like one of my secret sauces, sort of, um, is a reverse proxy will sit in front of your really heavyweight WordPress Apaches, and these will be really lightweight, this will be a really lightweight server what it'll do is sit between your WordPress and the world at large and broker the connections. And what it'll do is your backend WordPresses will just be there to generate content and then pass it to the front end. And then the front end will handle giving that out to clients. So what that means is you'll, you're able to handle more traffic um, with less RAM and uh, more quickly. So <coughs> it's kind of like... Uh, like say someone visits your site with a 56k modem and they're taking you know two minutes to download a page you have to dedicate a child an apache child you're one of your wordpress apache children to serving them that whole time if you do it with a front end proxy server the front end handles that negotiation and you may be you know your front end proxy server may use two meg of ram your back end processes may use 40 to run wordpress so a front end, a reverse proxy is huge benefit. And then if you're going to use a, for a reverse proxy, keep alive on the front end because that will keep a persistent connection between your clients, but not on the back end because you want your back end servers to uh, be able to make, to be really lightweight. And if you keep, keep alive on on the back end of the front end, then you're essentially locking to your max number of clients. All right. Blanks there, maybe. Um, mod deflate. So, Mod deflate, the goal again of performance is you want to serve as many people as quickly as possible. Usually the slower thing on a well-tuned site is the network. So if you use mod deflate, you're going to be passing less data over the pipe. Are people familiar with mod deflate or gzip encoding? So what it will do is it will take the HTML and other resources, compress it, and then send it to a web browser. And for HTML and CSS, this can result 
mm -hmm. in savings of 70% in terms of bandwidth. And the neat thing is because you force that content down the pipe quicker, the page renders quicker too. So said, like snap. You set that on the, uh, on, the, on the reverse proxy or on the uh, actual TFP side? You would do, I do it on the front end. I let Nginx do my gzipping for me. But um, Apache would mod deflate on your front end. I let the front end handle that because that's an appropriate thing in my mind for the front end to do is to handle gzipping and negotiating content. What are the downsides of doing that? Right, like because not everybody does that. Uh, I really don't understand why everybody doesn't do it. <laughs> um, one thing is some old broken clients can n not necessarily accept gzip encoding, but pretty much <coughs> I've never heard a complaint, and I don't think I've run a site without gzip encoding now for six, seven years. Um, so I just wouldn't even worry about it. I don't know why everybody doesn't use it. It has almost no overhead. Um, set a same max client setting. This is a little complicated. I'm not going to get into it. You can use a formula. I have a link in my delicious uh, account. Use a lighter weight front end proxy server like Nginx. Nginx is magic as far as I'm concerned. It's totally bizarre. Um, and we'll look at that hopefully. Um, front end proxy caching. So the neat thing about a front end proxy server is it's also a point where you can apply caching separate from your WordPress. So if you learn how to you know, manipulate Nginx as a front end proxy, you can accelerate and proxy content for any application, not just WordPress. Um, and then Apache Top, this is really neat, this is Top for Apache. So if you start Apache Top, you know you're getting hammered, Apache Top will watch your logs and tell you where your traffic's coming from and then you can switch through modes and whatnot. It's really fun. Um, okay, on the PHP level, uh, you want to enable an opcode cache. Do people know what an opcode cache is? So an opcode cache, what it'll do is it'll take a PHP file, um, and the normal way it works is a request comes in, the PHP file is statted um, to see if it's changed. PHP will read it in, turn it into opcode, and then execute it. An opcode cache will skip a bunch of that process and keep the pre-compiled PHP in shared memory that's available to all of your Apaches. And this can lead to pretty significant, it doesn't make your PHP run faster, but it um, can lead to a significant performance gain because you're not constantly reading the files and compiling them, reading the files and compiling them on every single request. So uh, one of the ones that I use is APC, which you can install just with pickle, um, <coughs> repair, whatever it is. Uh, I've never had a problem with it. Um, so APC, there's a link to that as well. Uh, make sure you allocate enough RAM to your opcode cache, and I'm gonna show you in the next slide. Um, you can consider not allowing stats. So basically, you can tell your opcode cache, don't check when files change. And that can give you a significant performance benefit. But the problem is, if you change PHP files, they aren't noticed until you restart the server. So this is really, if you have a really um, well-separated production environment, maybe you would consider it. But if you're like most everybody else and you make changes to live machines, you might not want to do this. <coughs> Okay, so this is an example. This is APC. This is the opcode cache. I found that 64 megabytes is more than enough um, of shared RAM to cache all of WordPress into an opcode cache. That's bad because that's memory fragmentation. Um, that means that you don't have enough RAM allocated uh, to your opcode cache and you're going to be recompiling more and you're going to be doing a lot of uh, I.O. to that RAM or whatever. And then this is good. You just want it to look nice and clean. So now we're going to get to WordPress itself. Like I said, there's two major audiences. There's logged in and not. If you don't have root access and you just have a WordPress site that's sluggish and you want to run faster, I would look at WP Supercache. Because WP Supercache um, is a plugin. It will, when a request comes in, it will figure out if you're logged in or not. If you're not logged in, it will grab resources as a static file directly off the uh, file system via a set of rewrite rules and never touch PHP. So essentially what it does is it, it like magically makes your site a static HTML website. And then that takes your ability to serve requests, like for a page, um, like a regular PHP page, you might be able to generate six to 10 per second. 
Apache can serve 2,000 a second if it's a static file, file system. So you, orders of magnitude improve, improvement in performance, and you don't need root to get WP Super Cache working. There's another one out there, W3 Total Cache, that I've not used much. Um, it does some of what WP Super Cache does, and it also has some neat things in terms of integrating with CDN's uh, content delivery network for you automatically. Um, I just haven't used it. Uh, there were some plugins that used memcache to try to do stuff, but I did, memcache is not a panacea. One nice thing about memcached is uh, you can have one machine generate the cache with multiple machines. Multiple machines use the same cache. It's only one place generates it. I don't think it's that great. Uh, the WP object cache, so there's a framework in place within uh, WordPress to allow large objects to be cached in shared memory or to the disk. Um, this is good for optimizing for logged in users because those people you need to give PHP to. You need to render the pages, they need to edit posts, that stuff needs to be done dynamically. So the object cache um, can help you there, but it won't help you if you are like most sites and most of your traffic is unauthenticated and people not logged in. So I would look at one of these systems that are going to statically render your page in a file system like WP Supercache. Another obvious one, disable used, in, used plugins, because a lot of plugins will parse through all of your output to look for special things, and that can slow you down. And then a CDN for media delivery. Does anybody use a content delivery network anywhere? OK. We don't use it, but I know a lot of people do. So our problem was we have 750 live blogs under blogs.law. Some of which are very large, and some of which have posts dating back to 2001. Um, we get, uh, we don't ever have that many people logged in simultaneously, maybe a couple dozen at most. We have many spiders, legitimate and not legitimate. Um, and it was adding up to what was almost like a constant distributed denial of service attack, the number of spiders that we were getting. Um, and the machine would, at some point, get into a load spiral, totally lock up, because all these spiders would come in, request all this oddball content, they'd take too long for WordPress to generate the pages, and our server would go down. So, and we have an enormous corpus of URLs to cache, because in WordPress Mu, we're working under a subdirectory system, we have some blogs that might have 2,000 posts in them, and an unknown number of comments, so. Um, and then the other thing is, our RSS feeds don't use FeedBurner, and RSS feeds are very expensive to generate in WordPress if they're not cached, and we don't use FeedBurner because we were around before them. So, too late to change. Uh, so our solution was to use Nginx as a front-end proxy. The nice thing about this is we have no performance plugins in the back-end. Uh, what happens is a request comes to Nginx, we figure out if you're logged in or not. If you're not logged in, we just use Nginx's ability to do front-end proxy caching to just give you the content. And so what that does is, I did a little bit of benchmarking, I think I get to at some point, maybe I'll talk about it later. I did have to add four lines of code to the WordPress core to emit a special header to Nginx, but I'm probably going to rewrite that as a plugin. And I need to document how all this works, because it's actually very easy, even though it may sound complicated. Um, the neat thing about Nginx is you can inspect URLs with really simple regexes and set different caching rules for different resources. So, for instance, our RSS feeds may be cached for 15 minutes for unauthenticated users, where JPEGs, I cache for a half hour because those are less likely to change as quickly. Um, static HTML pages may be 15 minutes. And you can set those the most flexible way that I've seen so far in a front-end proxy. Um, you're able to cache for both audiences, sort of. This is better for non-authenticated users, but for the back end, for login users too, you can still say cache JavaScript, cache CSS, and none of that stuff will ever get to your back end WordPress um, because Nginx sitting in front of your WordPress will handle it. Um, and you can cache everything, period. There's some WordPress plugins that aren't able to cache some things entirely. I think WP Super Cache does a pretty thorough job. Nginx doesn't care, doesn't care what you are. Um, I have the front end handle gzipping and logging as well. And then the neat thing about Nginx is it can, uh, you can inspect behavior of folks and block bad bots. If someone comes to you and requests too many pages per second, you can say, see you later. And so that's pretty easy to do as well. 
with an nginx. So the results, I'll get to some graphs next, but um, almost no problems since we did this last September. Um, Atom feeds over a network, this is a ridiculously fast network, um, from 6 per second raw WordPress to 2,500 per second, and then if I do it locally, factoring the network out, the benchmark tool wasn't able to go that high, basically. Um, so 7,000. And then testing it against plain old Apache. Apache is about half as fast. Oh, OK. Um, one thing that I thought was really weird is it doubled our network throughput. Because Nginx is so lightweight, we were able to just give stuff out to people quicker. I didn't really expect this. And I ran this by one of our other system engines. He's like, hey, the graphs are right. So um, also it halved our memory requirements. And we had done, we had tried to deploy a few different caching um, options. I was able to just remove all of that because it just didn't matter anymore. Nginx did, did it all for us. Um, except when I, I, I have to do function page up. OK. Uh, here are my pretty graphs. So. Many problems, many problems. This is over the course of a year, basically. This is where I implemented Nginx. This is used RAM. This is free RAM. All this green is buffer, file buffers. So this is all stuff that the operating system is using uh, to serve out files. The network, this is the throughput doubling. I still don't completely understand it, but whatever. It means we're giving stuff to people quicker. Um, and then this load, because it smoothed out so much because it's such a long time period, doesn't in here, it was like a nightmare. Every couple of days, evil things were happening. But then, right about here, I, in, I integrated this, and then this is a load of four where it starts to get problematic for this machine. Nothing. I have not had to worry about this <coughs> since the front-end proxy caching. And this weight I.O., I don't entirely understand what weight I.O. is. I think, the way I think of it is it's like your computer's waiting to give something out, and so more weight I.O. is bad because it's not able to service all the stuff it needs to do. Weight I.O totally negligible after implementing this. So then I just wanted to go through some random tools. Apache Benchmark. So if you're trying to um, you know, figure out why things are slow or, or have some metrics behind it, Apache Benchmark is a very simple command line tool that can just simulate a bunch of requests and tell you how long they take to complete. Um, Firebug, everybody loves Firebug. I think you probably heard that in every single presentation. Um, but you can use the uh, network panel to tell you how fast things are loading, which is very handy. Why slow? Um, I haven't used it much, but I know a lot of people go gaga over it. Siege is a more Unixy thing. I think it's a little old, but with Siege, you can essentially set up a profile to test and then get performance metrics off that. HTOP uh, is just a better version of top, Apache top, MySQL top. Explain, select, tells you, you know, the cost of a MySQL query. Um, and that's it. So that's how you can get in touch with me. And I need to update a little bit more, but I'll have links to some of these things on you. So we should just come up with questions. How are we going to copy the slides? Um, I'll put them on slide share. But how do we? You can find a WordPress Boston event on there, and we'll try to link to that. OK. Yeah. Okay. I haven't done that yet, but I'll do that. Uh, how did you generate those pretty pictures? With that was Ganglia which is a cluster monitoring tool that can tell you everything you want to know. No, it's open source. Mm -hmm. I had an SEO question. Everyone says that, you know, .gov and .edu are, you know, have really, from a patron point of view, are, are golden. So I'm a Harvard alum, so I signed up for a blog on your site. And does it start over in terms of page rank, or do, do I get benefit from Harvard, EDU, you know, I, um, it must mean something for the amount of spam we get <laughs> wanting to do link exchanges with us. I really couldn't tell you specifically. Do you have a question? Yeah, do, you have, um, do you have Nginx serving up static and dynamic content, or do you just do you have Apache serving up the static and then? Apache is handling the static, or I'm sorry, Apache is handling the dynamic content, and then Nginx statically caches everything. So it's kind of neat. Say a request for a JPEG comes in, Nginx passes that back. To Apache. Apache generates the JPEG. Nginx stores it in its cache, and now it's static. So is it pretty easy to get Nginx up and running? In a, in um, I need to finish this blog post, but it really was not that difficult once I figured out how to fit the parts together. Okay. 
Um, what do you, what would you think would be like the baseline skill level that you would need? Because I'm, I'm sitting here, I'm a programmer, and like mm -hmm. some of it, okay, I understand, and other parts will be What I would do is use WP Super Cache. Okay, that's simple. Yes. Okay. Absolutely. Yeah. Do, use WP Super Cache. This is more, yeah, I knew this was going to be nerdy, but I figured whatever. I get excited about this stuff. So, so you ended up in the end not using WP Super Cache by using the answer to all the us. And part of the reason I did that is because by learning Nginx and how its front end proxy caching works, I can put it in front of anything. And it's magic. I mean, it's incredible how high performance it is. Nginx, the whole time it's running, it's using about 10 meg of RAM to serve all of our requests. And we, we, don't have, we have a lot of URLs. We only get about 7 to 10 million page views a month. So it's not like we're gigantic. But, um, and then probably double that for bots. So, you know, it's pretty. And you don't use memcached on this thing? We do not need memcached because we, because Nginx puts everything on the file system and serves it statically for us, magically. Gotcha. And reads its own cache. So, so you use this for media wiki and stuff? Um, not yet, but we're, we're going to be. Because this has been so successful, we're going to start putting Nginx in front of everything. Right now, we just use Apache to find our proxy for all those other things. So you said a load of four on that box is problematic. That's not the, it's not a whole lot of processing in that box, I'm guessing. It is. It has four cores. So once you have, yeah, once you reach four, you're basically in trouble. So, so you're great. serving 750 blocks without a whole lot of horsepower. Correct. And Nginx is, you know, we were, we were surviving but not doing great. Implementing the static cache has, you know, totally changed. But WP Super Cache will get you really far as well. And you don't need to be real for a genius to install it. We have a divided database and We do have a database, a dedicated database server. So this is really just a front end app server. So there, I didn't want to get into all the infrastructure stuff, but there is a separation there too. When do you think you're going to get that blog post stuff to put? I will try to do it next week. Uh, and I will put it. Here. So, because it really was not that difficult, and um, if you understand the idea behind a reverse proxy, I don't think you have any problem getting this to work. Anyone else? Just an organizational question. So, the, the Berkman Center kind of, in effect, does all the blocks for all of Harvard, right? Some parts of Harvard is a big, it's like a herd of cats. Big place. Some HBS runs their own blog server, but anybody at Harvard can come to us and say, "I want a blog." Are you using Apache to do uh, like pretty permalinks and stuff? Because I was going to install uh, Nginx, and then somewhere along the line, I, I read that like pretty permalinks were going to be an issue. Not a single problem. The way it works is Nginx doesn't give a crap what Apache <coughs> back. Apache. Uh, okay. The rewrite rules on the Apache side get invoked. Um, WP Super Cache can integrate directly with Nginx, and you can do stuff. I don't. I didn't want to go that route because I wanted to have a very clean separation. And the way I have this set up is a totally clean separation. In fact, I could get Nginx out of the mix, restart Apache in like 30 seconds, and Apache would then be serving everything the way it was before. It's that clean and separation. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.